Welcome to the second episode. There you go. Welcome to the third. <laughs> Welcome to the second try for the 501 Companion, episode number two. Number two, it takes two to tango. Two is all about harmony and balance. When you're number two, you try harder. Two is the smallest prime wow, number well and the atomic number of helium. Nick, cue the hi-fi and set that music on to 11. Guys, we are in the show. We're in our second episode. Big shout out to you guys for showing up again. I'm very proud of you guys. I'm going to start off today uh, by introducing Nick Rufa. Nick, give people the, the lowdown on who you are and what you do. I'm Nick, your company's computer guy. You know, I'm the guy that comes to your desk and uh, make sure you reboot your computer. This is That's it. right. That's awesome. Nick, I like that. And Matt, who are you? If Nick is the guy that makes sure you re reboot the computer, what are you doing? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I don't know if I can follow that. He shook me on that. That was well done. <laughs> no, uh, so I am, I'm your marketing guy. Uh, I'm the guy you come to when you say, hey, we want to sell some stuff. We want to attract some people. We want to do some things. Let's make that happen. And I think together we make an awesome trifecta because while Nick's is fi fixing your computer, you're figuring out the marketing strategy. I'm telling you what to do with your website once it's live because I am a content strategist. And together we are here in the 501 Companion Podcast where we will be talking about 501c3s. We are very new to this, but we are all passionate about charities. So if you come along with us on this journey, you'll be learning with us. And like I said, this is only our second episode. So come along for the ride learn with us, and grow with us as we go. So we're going to start off simple today. Today, we're going to talk about a website that is almost like a clearinghouse or um, a rating house uh, for charities. It's called Charity Navigator. And for me, I look at Charity Nav Navigator as a way of addressing the anxiety of where to make my contributions. And I'm going to start with you, Matt. Are you ever concerned when you're about to write a check to a charity and, and what goes through your mind? Yeah, I mean, first off, you want to try and figure out what's the right charity for you. What do you care about? But once you're doing that, I mean, clearly, I think a lot of people go through and they think to themselves, how much of this money actually makes it to the end user, to the person it's intended to help, right? And that is what Charity Navigator is about. Nick, how about you? I mean, do you feel these same concerns that Matt and I feel when we start to uh, donate money? Don't you want all the money to go to the right place? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, there's always a concern. Is the, you, you see the, uh, the horror stories out there online, uh, the scams where, you know, the, there are people who are taking these donations and maybe 5% makes it to the, the, you know, the intended recipient. So it's scary. You know, if you don't have a place to look and check and verify, how do you know your, you know, your money's being put to good use? I mean, how do you know that they were once a charity and they're still a charity? Sure. Um, you know, are they a large charity? Are they a small charity? You may have your, your preferences. Are they a local charity? And that just leads me to the part that we're about to talk about, which is a rating system. Don't you wish there were a rating system? Well, there is. And I should note that Charity Navigator has nothing to do with our podcast other than we are doing research and learning as we go. And we, we knew about Charity Navigator for, for a while, and we've all used it as a reference point. Um, but as I disclaim that we have nothing to do with them, and this is not a paid endorsement, we all use Charity Navigator to find uh, hints and suggestions on the charities uh, that might interest us most, and also the charities that seem to run most effectively and efficiently. Uh, Matt, tell us a little bit about your experience looking at Charity Navigator. Again, we're not paid for this. We're just with you going along for the ride. 
Yeah, I mean, so there's a couple of different ways you can use it, right? If you're somebody who's looking to give, um, you can use it. <laughs> Your water bottle is clear. If you're somebody who's looking to give, you can go on there and you can check and maybe find, it makes recommendations. Here are other charities that are like the one you're looking for, maybe categorically. So there's kind of this discovery. Now, what do you do if you are a charity, right? This may be an area that you can go to find out how well you're rated and why. So they actually disclaim, they put on there, what are the metrics that you're using? And when you look at the numbers, it's not just a rating. They tell you exactly what it's about. How public are you? How much are you paying certain executives on the board? Um, what other, what things are, what, how transparent are you? What documents are you filing up, up to date on your filing, et cetera. And you could look at that and actually use it as a rating to understand your own organization and how people are viewing you. Yeah, I agree, Matt. I think one of the things that they do very well is provide these ratings that you can rank. For example, they have several uh, listicles, right? So if you work in marketing, you know what a listicles is. You know, the top 10 blank or the top five blank. You can even sort by charities by star ratings. I think the rating is what, one to five? And they can just start with uh, charities that are four and above. And I, for me, that makes me feel a little bit better that somebody has taken the time to vet these and think about how these charities are operating and then where your money goes. Nick, have you ever made a donation to a charity and gone to Charity Navigator just to check things out and see if there was uh, this was a good way to spend your money and invest? I have, yes. Personally used it probably a little bit over a year ago, but I, I did go to the, there for that purpose You know, when I, when I looked at it for sure. And I, you know, you, you've been working in digital for a long time, Nick. You can tell from the way a website is designed uh, if it's professional or if it's one of those old geos. Mm -hmm. What do you think when you see this website? What is your assessment? Um, it's a very well, you know, well put together website. Um, it's interesting that when I started the 501c3 lookup website, mm -hmm. Charity Navigator was, was maybe a year ahead of me or maybe a couple of years ahead of me. Yeah. And it serves a different purpose. You know, it wasn't ever our intention to do any kind of uh, rankings or ratings. Don't think we'll ever go that, that route ourselves. But uh, one of the things it helped me, I was working for a nonprofit at the time, I wanted to see what we needed to do. It was kind of like me searching for, for you know, how I would get this, this particular company ranked. So it helped me in that sense too, as a, as a person working for a nonprofit, how to help them. So whether you're a person, an individual looking for uh, guidance or you're a nonprofit and you wanna make sure you're doing the right things, I think it, it can serve both purposes. Hey Matt, tell me, tell me as, a, as our resident marketing and branding expert, why is it important for a website to appear credible, uh, both in design and layout and content, um, particularly when we're thinking about charities? Well, I mean, credibility is what you have, right? You're asking people to trust you. You know, you're asking people to donate money to you. I mean, that's number one, but number two, much more practical and utilitarian. We were talking about Charity Navigator. One of the things that they rate you on is transparency. And one of the ways that they rate you on transparency is whether or not you're listing a website on your 990, right? Your form 990, which is what you have to file with the, with the federal government, right? So if you don't have that, you miss those points and that ultimately lowers your rating on something like a Charity Navigator. So right there, you have two good reasons. Number one, so people can find information about you. And number two, give a little bit of trust. Number three, you want to have transparency and you want to get those scores up so that when people do research you and find you, they can get the information you're looking. Because there's lots of information you're going to want on that, right? You're going to want to list your board. You're going to want to list your information. You're going to want to list your mission. So this is all important information that you're going to want to have on your website. And then if you continue down that road, you're going to want to have a way that people can volunteer, that people can help, that you can see a calendar of events, that you can see things that are happening within your organization. Now, these are great points. And, and one of the things that really struck me about the Charity, Charity Navigator website that I thought they did very well um, was they update it frequently. Um, you know, when you go to a website and you see that the last update was in 2016 and that their copyright line is, I don't know, 2014, you start to wonder if anybody's there and if you send a check, what will happen? And what impressed me about their resource was the fact that they do 
keep it up to date. And they do a really good job. I'm going to ask you both to comment on, on this. As I think they do a really good job uh, with Omnichannel, right? They have a website that is consistent in look, feel, tone, and voice with their Facebook page, the same with their Twitter, the same with their Instagram, and even the same with their YouTube and their LinkedIn. Those are a lot of platforms. And those are a lot of places for people to both discover them, but that's a lot to maintain. And yet what I was impressed with was they must have a very good strategy for keeping this all up to date and consistent. It's not like they've abandoned any one channel. What are your thoughts? Me or Nick? Uh, I'm sorry. You, but Nick, I'll, why don't you give it a start? I'll, yeah. I'll go first. Yeah, um, I thought it was Nick's turn. It is yeah, Nick's turn. turn. I'll uh, go first. What first are your time. thoughts, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> buddy you said it i mean you've got to be up to date everywhere you've got to have that face social media presence whether it's facebook twitter instagram all three linkedin is another one uh where you know uh depending on what type of charity you are you probably want to have that page as well um it makes sense to have them all coordinated uh there's opportunities also to cross post you know if you have something on facebook is it on your twitter account um, are you publishing, you know, and that's probably more in your wheelhouse, buddy, but how often do you publish um, to those accounts as well? Uh, not everybody reads their Twitter every day or their Facebook page every day. So it may make sense to post things multiple times. Um, again, that's more in the content domain, but um, sure. I mean, super important, super important. You don't want the, you, you said copyright 2016. Maybe it doesn't even have a copyright page. Maybe there's uh, problems on the website structure itself, and that goes more into search engine optimization um, than the search engine marketing. It's, it's you know, or are, are you putting your yourself out there for, pe for people to find you? So. Nick, you know what I think? I think you've given us the perfect segue <laughs> into our topic of the month. And our topic of the month is search engine marketing. And we've tasked our marketing thinker, Matt Balo, to give us an overview of the basics of search engine marketing. Matt, can you lead us off on what search engine marketing is and what charities need to know about it? Absolutely. So when you're thinking about search engine marketing, um, I'm gonna categorize it into two groups, SEO and SEM. Now, do you guys know the difference? Well, there's a letter that's different, Matt. There's one has an SEM and one has an SEO. Are they Correct. different? Correct. That is the difference. And the difference is in that letter what it stands for. So O is for optimization and M we'll call management. But I think what will serve you better is to think of M as money and O as organic, right? Because when you think about SEM or SEO, the SE is the same. That's your search engine. And then M is if you're spending money to promote and O is if you're trying to gain organic traction by having content and content marketing on the site. Now, does anybody on here know anything about content marketing? Matt, I've, I've heard the words. Can you just help me with, uh, with those words and what they mean? Yeah, buddy, why don't you help us out, buddy, as our resident content marketer with how long you've been on the internet? 73, 74 years now? 73 years now. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the idea is um, your marketing is based on the content that people want to know, that um, you create content that is an effective driver to your website to help people solve a problem, right? Every product or service exists for a reason. And if you create content that helps people to both contextualize it, understand what it means to them, and then take action, you are engaging in content marketing. What's important right. about content marketing is it's also good for search engine optimization. So I'm going to bounce it right back to you, Matt. That's right. A plus, you passed the content marketing phase of our program today. But what's important about content marketing is there's certain things that you can do to help attract people to the website. You can have your content structured in a certain way. Most good templates and WordPress templates will help you like this, maybe give you some form of, of rating, right, Nick? There's plugins, right, sure. that we can use that can help and that analyze your content and give you a rating to help your search engine friendliness. Most of the time, you're going to be looking at your Google to see what those ratings are because it is the most used search engine, right? And you're gonna to wanna to look at where you can get placement in the search engine results page. 
Now, there are lots of ways to do this, but one of the most common things you're going to want to do, and it's very hard for people because it's not something that they enter the charity or even business world to, to do, is to keep content fresh, right? A lot of times you're going to build something and you're going to have it there, and you're going to set it, and you're going to be really happy, and you're going to celebrate, and you're going to walk away and go do your thing. And at that point, it's going to get indexed, it's going to get an initial hit, but that's it. Then you're done, now you're gonna fall off. You do have to keep delivering. And that's where some of these social elements come in. And this is again, where content marketing and content mining and repurposing of content and linking of content, even paying a writer to help you with your content can get things out there for your website. Now, I'm gonna pause there for a minute because I think it's also important when you're doing that to understand why are you doing it? It's a lot of work right? It's a lot of work to deliver content on a deadline. It's not easy. So you want to understand what you're trying to do. Why are you trying to attract people to your website? What are you looking to do once you get there? Are you just looking for awareness, just looking for fame, or do you want people to attend an event because your calendar is there? Or do you want people to donate because your donate button is there? Or do you want people to just be aware or surface issues in a neighborhood or share their stories or what are you looking to do with your SEO will help you understand what kind of content you want to put there because it reflects back at you, right? So that's optimization. If you go down the optimization route, there are probably 10, 12,000 things that you could do to help with that. And ultimately, what I find in a lot of cases is somebody starts a small business and they put up a website and then they wait and we get 12 people today. And it's a difficult thing because you're up against part of optimization is understanding who are you up against and you're up against is not always who you think it is, right? It, it, it may be you're up against your nearest competitor, a different charity. It may be a paid organization with a marketing team and a high budget. It many times it's a government site or an open site. Wikipedia is always going to take those first couple of links, right? And there's only about 10 of them on a web, web page, 10 to 14, right? So SEO is something that people go to because it's low cost. But if you've done well, if you've constructed your website well, you may want to think about SEM. You may want to think about that M, that money, to spend a little bit of dollars to get you that boost because traffic helps get you traffic. It's like an investment. It pays off over time. When you have a lot of clicks, the search en engine says, oh, there's a lot of clicks on this. It might be popular. Let me surface it more in results. But more on that next time. Matt, you've certainly given us a lot to think about between SEM SEO and content marketing. But I don't wanna leave Nick out of this because Nick is our resident tech guy. Nick, Nick, if, if you were running a website, but not necessarily technical, what are two or three things that you might ask your technical team to look at to ensure uh, compliance with SEO best practices, especially for a charity that is going to be relying heavily on the O, which is the organic? Yeah, I, you know, there's some basic, you know, the, the search engine op optimization as Matt, you know, described earlier. There's also the more technical side, the more, uh, you know, site structure. How is your page, how is your page set up? Is it properly set up in HTML, the code that makes the website, the web page run? Um, you know, do you have a title tag? So does your title tag, when you, when you look at your, when you go to Google and you open up your web page, you see what's in the title up there, does that, say what you intend people who know nothing about you to see when they get to that page. So things like that, having the right title in on your page, uh, making sure again that the page is structured properly. Um, do you have a header tag, an, what they call an H1 tag, that again can maybe repeats what the title says. And you only have one of those. That's the most important uh, heading on your page. You should only have one and it should kind of match or be closely matched to your title. Um, those are basics. Uh, other things that Google looks for is SSL or secure sockets layer or the little padlock. Do you have a secure website? So if people are going to you know, type any information on your website, yep. you don't want that information to leak out. So SSL is another thing that Google looks for. Um, and, you know, mobile, typically, 
mobile is another thing, mobile friendly. So now is your site created in 19, you know, 97 technology where, you know, besides having the blink tag, you know, where things blink up on the page back and forth, do you have, uh, or is it modern? Can you, can you open it on, on your iPhone and everything lays out appropriately? You can read the text, you know, being in the fifties now, 50 year old, can you read everything on that mobile phone? So is it viewable? Um, and page speed as well. It goes a little bit deeper into things, but how quick does your site come up? You know, when you, when you, when you click enter, you wait five, six, seven seconds before you see anything load. That's not a good thing. You want to be able to have your page up in a couple seconds. My so goodness, remember like the days back when it was 11 seconds? And I feel like yeah. now it's like down to about, like it used to say you have to load it under 11 seconds back in the day. Yeah. Now it's like, yeah. if it's not there instantaneously, we're Yeah, gone. a couple, three seconds. So. <laughs> a couple, three. So right. guys, Google has tools to help. Like you can search right exactly. in Google mobile friendly test, put your URL test. It'll give you the feedback. Google wants you to have they a help great you. web page. Yep. They'll help you. So guys, one last thing. And I know that Matt, you had mentioned this when you were explaining this prior to the show. Um, there is a relationship between search engine optimization score yep. and the amount of money that you spend in search engine marketing. And because charities are usually, you know, they're pretty tight on cash. Yep. What do they need to know? Oh, absolutely. There's a link. Okay. If you think about it this way, right? Google exists. And the reason it's successful is because out of the 3.8 billion web pages for the topic that you just typed in, it's got to put 14 of those on a page in front of you. And those top four or five have to be the right ones. If Google returned the wrong ones, it wouldn't work, nobody'd use it, right? So if you think about what Google is incentivized to do, is they're incentivized to give good results. Okay, now how do they do that? They wanna index your page to see if the terms that are going into it match what somebody is looking for. So they actually read the content electronically of your website. Now Yahoo used to do this by hand, right? That's how they started. So, but Google indexes your page automatically and reads the terms on your page. That's why there's certain good practices for repetition, use of vernacular, other things in the content generation of your page. And Buddy can talk more on content strategy on that later. But what this is ultimately gonna do is it's gonna give you an idea, a rating. Now, when you want to go and type in and buy, pay for, S-E-M, M is for money, and you wanna buy a term that is not well indexed on your page, Right. If you think about that, if I wanted to buy something that was for my competitor so that it's a competitive buy or something like that, Google's going to say, hmm, this website is all about phishing, but they're trying to buy terminology for flying a kite. So if I let them do that, when people typed in flying a kite and they got a phishing page, they may be upset with Google. So Google doesn't want that. What they want is for you to have a good page that has good indexing. Now, when you buy a term, you have to pay for it. Google will charge you less if it matches your site. They will charge you more if it doesn't match your site, right? Now, if you think about that, having a good site with good SEO for the topics that you're interested with and good buying for the things that you're trying to accomplish, you're going to pay less because you're buying the terms that you've optimized Google to find on your site. Make sense? Matt, it makes perfect sense. And it is deeply relevant for uh, charities um, because they have to be very lean with their money. And yep. it is uh, important for the discovery of those websites if they come in through Charity Navigator or if they just come in through Google and check Charity Navigator it is all tied in together. And guys, speaking of tying in, we are almost out of time. So I'm gonna tie this up. Matt, where can they find this podcast if they want to subscribe and be part of this ecosystem of awesomeness that we are creating right now? Well, I believe the podcast will be anywhere you find podcasts, whether you're on Apple or you're on um, Google, Android, you will find it in your podcast application. So we're gonna to see to that. And if you're looking for the video, you'll be able to find it on our YouTube channel, 501 Companion. Or if you really want to find it, you can always find us 
at 501c3lookup.org, which is part of uh, Nick's organization. That is fantastic. Speaking of Nick, Nick, where can they find you? Um, you can find me at 501c3lookup.org, as Matt said, but we also have a Twitter page. Uh, 501c3 lookup. So you can find us on Twitter there. You can find me personally at Nick underscore Rufa on Twitter. I don't post all that much, but uh, I'm there lurking. So if you got, you want to contact me, you can got, contact me there. That sounds good. And, and We're in that know? very cool looking diner. I'm just, I, you know what, I'm going to have a new background every week until I find something that good. I love yours. <laughs> love yours too. <laughs> hey Matt, where can they find you? Where are you dropping this kind of truth every day? I'm dropping this kind of truth every day. Well, you can find me on Twitter at mbalogh.com, mbalo.com, um, dot com, at mbalo, at Twitter, or are you, are you still active on LinkedIn? Because I think you were the uh, yes. the reigning king of LinkedIn among our group, right? You know what? LinkedIn is an excellent social site. Maybe at some point we'll cover the different social media sites for organizations. I'm personally a fan of LinkedIn primarily because of their groups. I find that they do a really great job. A lot of professionals having good conversation. That sounds great. And I am Buddy Scalera, and you can find me on all of my platforms at Buddy Scalera on Twitter, Buddy Scalera Instagram, and at BuddyScalera.com. And to everyone who tuned in today and is going along with us on the journey, we thank you very much. We hope you've gotten a lot out of this and hope you continue to go on the journey with us on the 501 companion podcast. Thanks everyone. See you soon.